24 hours it is, and that is the whole a day can take, and a lot more it can take. To some, 24 hours is a burden. For others, it's yet to be enough. And that is the bad news. You can't have much more, it's only 24 hours. But the good news is that um, no matter what it is, no matter how much it is, you are the pilot. You decide what to do with your time. You decide what to do with, it, with each and every hour you have in the 24 hours. You're welcome to Reflections. My name is Yusuf Dadabu Usman. We're reaching you from the Nigerian Television Authority. Every week on this program, we scan through the Nigerian society to fish out the statesmen among us, the best among us, the notables among us, and the royalty among us in order to, you know, tap from their wealth of experience and then, you know, look forward towards making Nigeria better and creating a very better society. My guest was the Mugajin Gari Zuzu, and of course now the Emir of Zuzu. He is Ambassador Ahmed Nuhu Bomadi. Let me start by congratulating you for attending this throne. And of course, it's a throne that you came over in a hundred years from your grand grandfather, I mean for, for, from your grandfather. And that's a situation that calls for really the biggest of congratulations. Congratulations once again, Royal Highness. Um, we may not have much of the time we require, but let me just say or ask that, um, how does it feel in the first instance, having come all this way to be, you know, the Emir of Zuzo in this lineage a hundred years after? Um, uh, going by your question, uh, it is really gratifying at least to be chosen by Almighty Allah, you know, to step into the shoes of my ancestors in the coveted seat that you know, they built and occupied. Uh, the last from my the ruling dynasty was uh, the famous A.M. Emir Ali Uden Sidi, who was uh, an Emir here um, between 1903 when the British came. He was the first, you know, to be turbaned by the British and also to be dethroned by the British in 1920. So uh, technically he spent about 17 years on the throne. Um, uh, so he had his, um, you know, glorious period, you know, under the British rule, uh, up to his exit, you know, from the throne. So since then, uh, many family members, including my late father, No Bumali, you know, they contested for the position. Allah did not will it for them to, to be here. So I'm grateful to Allah you know, for actualizing the dreams of our fathers, you know, to be in this um, uh, position effortlessly. One would also want to know, therefore, coming from this background as a royalty, and of course somebody who has gone far and wide in learning and in career and in trying to know people and places, 
you should have at least thought at a time that you may or you may not be the king or the emir of this zone. At very prominent times, there are issues like that in the royal family where one thinks he will, he will not be. Has that thinking ever crossed your mind? Well, um, despite my pedigree uh, coming from the first ruling house here, my great grandfather Malam Musa was the flag bearer of, uh, you know, the Emirate, you know, by given by uh, the founder of the Caliphate, Osman Namfudio, uh, shortly after the conquest of uh, the House Estates, and also um, uh, three others, also his, two of his children, C. W. Gadra and Abu uh, Bakr, were his. Uh, uh, direct grand, uh, sons and his grandson, you know, Aliu, you know, um, who happened to be the last from the family. Um, it took a century, you know, uh, for any member of the family to emerge again. Because unlike other emirates in northern Nigeria, you know, Zaire is very unique because we have four ruling dynasties that are unrelated except, of course, maybe by, you know, marriages, but we're not, you know, uh, descendants of, you know, one person uh, like other, all other emirates in northern Nigeria. So uh, that is why the complexity of the emirate is, is, is very, uh, you know, uh, different from, you know, all other emirates. Uh, so whenever this tool is vacant, uh, there is always a level playing ground you know, for people, you know, to contest from the, you know, four ruling dynasties. And uh, it has always been a fierce battle, you know, and uh, we saw what happened in 1975, which, you know, um, it was keenly contested, you know, and uh, uh, another ruling house, you know, got it. And uh, so if you look at all this, yes, of course, you know, my dream was not to be, you know, an emir. Yeah. My dream was to be either the Magajingali or Madaiki in Zozo. But I wanted my father, not myself. And I keep repeating this, you know, repeatedly. I was around, I was only nine years old, when my predecessor was, you know, turban as the emir of Zozo in 1975. So, and uh, we took it. And uh, I think my father was one of the first to you know, pay allegiance and pay homage to him. I'm a little bit interested about that complexity in the ruling houses of the Zozo Emirate. How come four families that are not related and then now being heirs to the throne at any other moment in time, what really happened? Can you take us back or down history lane and then look at, look at see this complexity? Well, you know, people have different accounts, but uh, uh, whatever I'm going to say, I'm relying on, you know, historical facts, which are verifiable. Uh, uh, you know, at the wake of the jihad in 1804, my great-grandfather, Malam Musa, uh, at that time there was no Nigeria. There was Western Sudan. So when Sheikh Usman bin Fodio left Futatoro in Senegal, uh, present-day Senegal, that's his home, you know, uh, country, um, he came to Timbuktu in present-day Mali Republic, you know, uh, where he went to school of Sheikh Jibril bin Omar. And that was the birthplace and hometown of my great-grandfather, Malam Musa Bomali. And that's why you know, our own family, you know, we're called Bomali, someone from Mali. Yes, so that's his hometown. And he was at that school as well. So they moved, you know, to Maratta, which is present day Niger Republic. And that's the school of uh, uh, Osman bin Duri. They were in Maratta in Niger Republic today because there was nothing like Nigeria at that time. And uh, they were studying under the king of Gobir, Bawa Jangorzo. After Bawa Jangorzo, there was Nafata. But after, uh, sorry, Yakuba. After Yakuba, there was Nafata. Up to Yumfa. And up to Yumfa, you know, um, that was when, you know, there were some, you know, issues. 
because Yonfa, from the accounts, he was deviating from the main Islamic, you know, uh, injunctions at that time. And then they struck and, you know, defeated him. When, you know, uh, Yonfa was defeated at Tavkyung Koto, you can check all the books of history. Mala Musa was one of the principal officers of Jihad. He, was, he participated in the, uh, uh, the Battle of Tavkyung Koto. And, you know, flags of authorities were distributed. Um, initially, at that time, Zuzo was under the Hausa king, Jato. He was a very good Muslim. And uh, uh, there was no need for jihad in Zaria at that time. So hence the reason why Mala Musa was one of the people that escorted Suleiman, the Emir of Kano when Suleiman was given the staff of authority to go to Kano. He was one of the uh, miseries of Shehu that escorted him to Kano. He spent about uh, uh, six months in Kano. And then he, it was at that point that he, he visited Zaria. He stayed in Zaria uh, and uh, the, um, well, at that time, you know, the Hausa kings were here. And uh, there was no reason for the jihad. So he was teaching the residents of Limam and Kona here. He was teaching the Quran and Fikr, and he was also studying from the revered uh, Imam there. And he established contacts with the uh, family of the Limam in Juma. And then from here, he went back to Kano again. And then they set out for Daura, you know, with uh, the Dantunku of Kazori, founder of Kazori Emirate. And from there, you know, um, they participated in the enthronement of Sarikindawla Isiaku. Uh, you can check all the books of history and you will find it there. And, you know, um, it was while he was there, then the chief imam of Zaria at that time, you know, sent him a word saying that Zaria was ripe for the jihad. And then he set out for Sokoto again. And that was when he was given the flag of authority with a mandate saying that when you get to Zaria, because there were some Fulani families that had paid allegiance to Shehu. Uh, so when you get to Zaria, you should engage them to assist you in uh, 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 engaging the, the kings here in Zaria if there was any resistance. But the mandate was for him to come, you know, and present, you know, message from Shehu saying that the uh, king of Zaria, Macau at that time, should, you know, go back to what his father was doing, to be a very upright and, you know, uh, to govern in line with the Islamic Sharia, which, uh, you know, w w from all the accounts, there were deviations from what his father, you know, uh, was doing in his time, which, you know, did not permit the jihad in Zaria at that time. So when he came, you know, Makau fled, you know, to Zuba, and finally now, you know, to Sleja. So that was, and Mala Musa was on the side of Zuma, this present Zuma rock that you see. And uh, he stayed there for about six months. And then he sent a word to Shehu saying that um, the king of Zaria did not even wait to accept the, um, the message from Shehu. And then that was when he got the directive from Shehu Usman Mfodio to revert back to Zaria, return to Zaria and take over as the first emir. So this is the genesis. And then those Fulani clans that he was mandated to engage them when he arrived. There was Malin Kilba, Malin Ya Musa, Abdul Karim, and then there was an aberration, that is the Suluba dynasty, which came around 1853, when my, uh, my, uh, my father's grandfather, uh, Sidi Abdul Qadr, you know, uh, was dethroned. He ran for only eight months and, you know, he was dethroned. So, and that was when, you know, the fourth ruling house emerged. Yes. So this is, you know, the accounts and uh, 
uh, and that's how we have four unrelated families, you know, as, you know, Emirates in Zuzu. Or like other, uh, you know, Emirates is in Sokoto, they're all descendants of Shehu. We have the house of Bello, Atiku, Rufai, and Buhari, you know, where the Suki came from. So they are all from those families. If you go to Kano, they are descendants of one person, Ibrahim Dabo. We only have branches, you know. If you go to uh, um, Bidya, they are all descendants of Malen Dendo. If you go to Ilorin, they are descendants of Malen Alimi and all other principal emirates of northern Nigeria. So that's how, you know, um, we have a different system here in the area. But whenever this tool is vacant, yes, the four dynasties are at liberty, you know, to express their interest. And if they're lucky, you know, they become, you know, the emirs. And it's not like what is obtained in Bidda, they rotate. But in the area here, it's an open contest. If you are lucky, you get it. But even then, you know, in the past, there was only one time that we had, you know, father to son. That was, uh, you know, when uh, Amy Ayero was uh, assassinated in the battlefield, his son, Kwaso, took it over. Even though there was, you know, uh, an appointment letter to one of my grand, you know, uncles, Madai Kiali, he was given a letter, uh, uh, with, sorry, Waziri in Sokoto was, you know, in the outskirts of the area to turban him as the next emir. If you check, you know, the uh, government in Zozo is there. But uh, the emir had already taken over here. So there was an agreement that if he was not there, then, you know, there was not going to be any you know, there would not be any contest, you know, uh, he will take over since there was an appointment for someone from Sokoto. But he passed on before the, the, the reign in Emir. So I, uh, I would have been the, the sixth Emir from my own ruling house if that, you know, deal went through. So this is the reason why, and that was the only time, you know, there was father to son direct succession. But all the time, it was an unwritten law, you know, uh, or practice that it goes round to the other, you know, families. But uh, from the reign of uh, Leo and Sidi, uh, you know, uh, one family stayed for uh, three successive regimes and another family, two successive regimes, which was not the practice in the past. So, uh, and that's why we had five emirs, you know, from two ruling houses. And then I just came in now, you know, just two years now. Five emirs from two ruling houses. And uh, you said it was a question of uh, who becomes now, not really who, you know, uh, takes after his father. We're not in England or, or in some, you know, places. And Zaria, I think if there's anywhere democracy is, you know, being practiced in monarchy, is, I think it's also Emirates, you know, and, uh, you know, at least um, we, find, we appreciate, you know, the, the way it is being done. It has never been a quiet or smooth, you know, uh, uh, um, succession in, in most of the uh, periods in the past, if you read. You'll find out it wasn't only that when you know maybe two heavyweights fight, then a compromise candidate you know steps in and 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 and, and, and take over. Yours wasn't so much of a you know a very you know smooth one, I must say, given the fact that there were so many contestants in that regard. You know, the late Emir had his sons who were really interested, and some other ruling houses were there who really wanted it. And then um, there you are, if you marched, and then a big congratulations to that effect. How are you managing the ruling houses, given the contest and the emergence? Um, for me personally, I feel, you know, um, despite the fact that I came from the first ruling house of the flag bearer, I still have blood relationship with the second ruling house. 
because my my mother's grandmother, her father's mom, because my mother is a princess also from Sokoto ruling house, but her uh, her father's maternal side, they came from the Bornao dynasty here. Uh, the mother of my grandfather, that is my mother's father, you know, uh, is a princess from Borna dynasty. She's the daughter of Makamaja, for, uh, son of Sir Kinzazo Abdu. So I have some relationship with the Bari Bari dynasty. Um, but that is not, you know, a kind of uh, um, reason why there shouldn't be any acrimony or kind of affairs contest. We always had uh, issues, but you know we close ranks when 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 an emir emerges. But now uh, and and even in the past, yes, you know some people disappeared. You know you leave town if you ascend the position of emirship, you eliminate everybody, all your opponents. You send them packing, or you don't give, you don't even offer, you know the opportunity for them to to come and. Uh, to come and uh, uh, be part of the administration. And hence the reason why, you know, after paying the first allegiance, then you withdraw. If he wants to t in tag along with you, then you come. If he doesn't want to tag along with you, then you leave. Most of my granduncles and grandfathers, they were on exile at some periods. Yes. Including, you know, the last emir from our ruling dynasty, Ali Udansidi. He was in Kontogura. Yes. For many years, he was in Kontogura on exile. So that's how it is being done. So what we're saying, we're in modern times now. So that's why when I ascended the throne, I called on everybody. That was my first, you know, um, interview that I want all of us to come together. And I can recall even, you know, when the late Emir was turbaned in 1975, I knew what my father went through, despite the fact that he lost the th throne, you know, for the late Emir. But he went round, you know, to all the princes from different ruling dynasties, appealing to them, let us not look at the Emir, let us look at the throne. So come back and pay homage to him. I was told this by one of the princes from another ruling house. He said he was much younger like a son, but he was shocked when he visited him and requested all of them you know, to pay allegiance to the immediate past Emir. So I believe you know, when I came, I should even take it further. You know, now that I'm here, everybody should come. Let us tag along. First, for, for many reasons, apart from my own ruling dynasty, the Malad dynasty, yes, I don't believe, uh, okay, yes, apart from my own ruling dynasty, I'm, as I've just mentioned, you know, I'm, you know, related by blood with the Bari Bari dynasty. And then for the Kazina ruling dynasty, they are my illos. And there are some marriages in the past also, um, my, uh, uh, my great-grandfather's sister uh, was married to the first emir from the Kazanawa dynasty, uh, the first, the great-grandfather of the late emir, Abdul Karim, was married to uh, Gimbia Atu, so daughter of Mala Musa, the first mm -hmm. emir in the emirate. So there was that, you know, relationship. And uh, even now, you know, my wife is the daughter of the late Emir. So I do, I, I, that's the reason why I said, let us have a paradigm shift from the ugly past, how it was, you know, uh, being, you know, done. When you become an Emir, you get rid of all your opponents. No, that is not my own, you know, approach. I said, let everybody come. If you come, we tag along. If you don't, Bye bye. I have, you know, some replacements uh, in waiting. So that's my approach. How have the ruling houses or those in the ruling houses, you know, embraced this very noble idea of yours, which I believe 
was a fallout or a shootout or a gain from your father? I think it is fine because at least 95% uh, of them, you know, we relate, you know, very well. I don't think if I have anything against any one of them. And uh, as against, you know, sending them parking you know, somewhere, even elevated. Yeah. So I don't have any, any reason to elevate. God has done everything, you know, for me, alhamdulillah. At least I was able to attain this exalted, you know, position, you know, at a time that I least expected. I was out there in, in Bangkok when the Emir passed on. I only came here six days after he died because it was COVID period. So when, and I was the last, you know, to even submit my application, you know, because I was told that I uh, must, you know, write an application because my assumption was if the uh, electors find me suitable, then let them do what they wanted to do. And uh, if not, so I was not going to write any application. So my cousin who passed on, you know, a few months after, uh, after my ascension, um, uh, tell Bonzozo, Abdelkader Fatih, may Allah grant him al-Jannah Fiddos. He called me the day I was coming back to Nigeria at the airport. He insisted that I must write an application. I said, Telba, you guys should go ahead. Because even though at the time the Emir died, I was the most senior member of the royal family, of all the families, because I was the most senior around, because we didn't have Madaiki, who was one step ahead of me. So, but as Magazine, I was next in line. So I was the most senior. And I held that position for 20 years. So I was not an obstetrician. And then, but I was out of the country. So I said other members of our family, you know, should go and, 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 and present their application if they had to write an application. But I was, uh, you know, uh, not too comfortable to send an application because I felt that uh, it, it, it should come natural. That was my thought. Why were you thinking like that? Because I was not desperate. I was never desperate. And uh, I, I had, you know, uh, a feeling that if it will be, it will be. That's it. And I never went to anybody in Nigeria. I challenge anyone that will say that I went to his house, you know, to solicit for his support to come and make me an emir. I didn't go to anybody. I was, after all, I was not even around. Yes. So I took it as an act of God. And it's I, what I keep telling people that cares to listen. You know, uh, leadership or emirship or whatever form of uh, position of authority is not, is not uh, something that is being orchestrated or or, uh, yes, as human, certainly since God is not going to reveal, you know, a message to you directly, yeah, to pass through some, you know, human beings. But, you see, for me, I never, you know, had that, uh, you know, um, um, how do I put it? I didn't go to anyone. I didn't. So it came in the natural way. But one would really still question further in case of uh, a royalty like you yeah. uh, here to the throne, of course, before, before now, who was supposed to be, of course, for many reasons, on the search. Now thinking that if it comes, it comes. If it doesn't, it doesn't. That's fate. Is that a strength, you know, drawn from your Islamic belief? that it is God's will to do it, or it's just some sort of non-challenge, excuse me for the word. Well, honestly, you know, I have these strong feelings that uh, what God has uh, uh, written that it will be, it will be. And then secondly, it's not about influence or power. Because if 
it was influenced. In 1975, my father would have been the emir. If it was influenced, he was the most influential of all the contenders. But God said he was, it was not his time. And he didn't make it. He was a minister in the federal government as foreign minister of Nigeria. Emir Shah Idris was a private secretary of the late, then Emir. The late Emir was my brother's age mate and classmate. So my father was old enough to be his father. In fact, the Emir told me that my brother was about six months older than him. Because I had had a brother who was 30 years older than me. So I see that as an act of God. And if you look at, you know, if you check everything about him, they are not, you know, at the same level at that time. So that is why I look at it. It's not power. And then if you look at other emirates too, Ahmad Bello, you know, would have been the, the, the sultan of Sokoto. At the time, you know, uh, uh, Sultan Abu Bakr took over. And he had the power even subsequently to, to appoint and even remove emirs. If you look at other emirates again, you know, um, uh, if you uh, go to Kazina, our next door neighbor here, Hassan Kazina was there. You can even swear by the Quran that, you know, definitely he was going to be the emir of Kazina because of power and influence. So it's not about power and influence. It's the will of God. <coughs> and even of recent, you know, Galadima and Kano Tijana Hashman, even the present Galadima of Kano, were there when Sanusi emerged as you know, an emir of Kano. Not because he was CBN governor. Or, he was even kicked out, like us, you know, from the system. So his will of God, he said, I know, up to now, I still believe is the will of God. Congratulations, sir. Thank you. You watch your reflections of reaching you from the Nigerian Intelligence Authority, the NTA. We reach you every week with personalities who have great things to say. And of course, influence you out there what they say. We'll take a break now. We'll be back in a moment. When Shagari wanted to make me a minister, he called me. He said, uh, I want you to develop and deliver still the life of my administration. He says, sir, do you have that much confidence in me? He said, yes. This was a politician now talking. And I did. And I delivered still to Nigeria in six, six months' time. I'm committed to a united Nigeria where nobody is discriminated against on the basis of his religion or tribe. Ojoko didn't want any settlement. He didn't want to come back to Nigeria, to return to Eastern region. He was bent on secession. Have we really learned lessons from the Civil War? We have not. I'm, I'm telling you. And the main people who have not learned, let me come, let him say it. It's you people. We who? The journalists. All right, you welcome back. Uh, so I let's now take a little deviation and then look at some other aspects of this world too. And then of course, uh, this world is, it is very sad. It's often been said that uneasy lies the head, the head that wears the crown. And of course, uh, that's the burden of leadership. And that's the burden of being, you know, a father to everybody, especially in this Emirate. How heavy is this burden? Well, um, for me, I can say this is a new area completely, despite the fact that I was born and bred in the system, and at the same time, I held the strategic position of Magajingari, even though I was not a full-time or a district head. You know, I only took the title because I was still a career, you know, person at the time I ascended, uh, sorry, at that particular time 
for 20 years, you know. So, but I, I still find it, you know, uh, uh, very difficult, you know, to understand, you know, the system uh, in certain, you know, areas. So certain areas in the sense that, okay, I'm just learning, you know, about the district administration, you know, from the experienced hands, you know, some of the uh, older people in the system, because I was never a district head, like most of, you know, the contemporary emirates in, in Nigeria today, because if you look at other emirates, you can see uh, late emir of Kano, uh, Adobairo, we had some, you know, similarities from foreign service, you know, to the throne. He was not a district just like me. Same here from foreign service to this. And if you look, even Sanusi, he was not a district head. Uh, Sultan Dosuki was not a district head. It's Unipe, the current Sultan, you know, and a host of others. Like, like, there's a kind of you know, departure from what it used to be in the past. So you have to, you know, uh, learn from those people that you, you know, uh, met in the system uh, about the district administration. Um, so we are learning in that area. But all other, you know, areas of general administration is have been part of the system. I was one of the key elements here, and uh, uh, we contributed you know, uh, on quota during the last, you know, uh, regime here. So I can say I know almost everything that, you know, was uh, being done. So even though now I'm the man in charge, yesterday I was, you know, one of the lieutenants. Yeah. But we learned so much, you know, from the late Emir, who was the longest serving Emir because I think he was uh, one of the youngest to ascend the position, uh, you know, at a very tender age, he was 39. But uh, most of us, uh, we ascended the throne from the age of 50. Like I came here at the age of 54, yes. Um, looking into your resume, and of course trying to do much more, and then see who the owner of Jezo is, and of course, facts about where you schooled, where you worked, your career, and the rest of them. Um, one striking thing about these areas that you went through is the fact that you've been as simple as any other person else, not talking about the royalty. You've been a man of the people all through from school to the areas you worked, especially outside. And you've been somebody who has really been carrying people alone wherever you are. These are attributes that, you know, speak volume about you and, of course, about this very set. Were they really inherited or they were just natural things that came? Or you just felt it was normal not to really show off so much? The home training, you know, is playing a very significant, you know, uh, part of my life because uh, my late father was an accomplished man when I was born. He was 50 years old when I was born. So, um, uh, so you can see he was old enough to be my grandfather because my late brother's mates, you know, they have children that are even older than me. So you can imagine. So, um, so I was being trained, you know, to uh, to be a complete, you know, man, you know, from day one. Not to be trained as a small boy or a child, because what I was being taught at that time was to be the head of the family in case he was not there. Uh, so, so many things that my age mates were not doing, I was exposed to doing that, you know, from the beginning, you know. So that kind of training gave me an age over most of my, my age mates. And then secondly, you know, um, 
I feel you don't have to flaunt it that you're the son of so so person. That's what my father never liked. So you should always try and be better than me, and not to be the son of a noble Mali or Magazingali or whatever you know position he held at that time. Because you don't even have, you cannot even dare do that. Yes. So you just go and earn a living, you know, and uh, that's the reason why all of us should check on all my siblings. That was the training. Not to rely on your father or, you know, uh, to be dropping his name all over the place. No, that was not the home training we received. So we were raised in the same house that you cannot differentiate between us and our cousins or even our, you know, house helps and, and, and supports, you know, in the house. They bear the same name, his name, you know. And in fact, some bear the name much more than we do. So, uh, and quite a number of uh, uh, the family uh, relations and some the even servants in the house. A lot of people didn't know that he was not their father until when he passed on. Yes. So that's the kind of uh, upbringing we had. Okay, um, I, I was about to even chip in a little bit earlier when you're talking about how he asked you to go fend for yourself and then find, or find your own level in the world. Yes. I was about to ask how influential he has been on your life uh, when I was trying to correlate his position as a Minister of Foreign Affairs and you uh, at now, you know, before ascending to the throne, ambassador in uh, Bangkok. Well, I can say by accident, I went into foreign service. Even though that was my desire at the beginning. Yes, he was the first minister in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, as Minister of State, but with cabinet rank, uh, 1st October 1960 and the Prime Minister Abakar Tufa Balewa was the main minister. And the following year, uh, Balewa stepped down for Dr. Jaja Wachuku, who became the substantive minister. Still, my father was the junior minister. In 1965, just a year before I was born, Jaja Wachuku was dropped, and then my father was elevated to be the substantive minister in the ministry up to the coup in 1966. And when he left, General Gawon took over as foreign minister under Ironsi. So you see, um, he was minister long before I was born. He, from 60s to 66, you know, he was minister of foreign affairs. He left that position six months after then I arrived. So I had no connection with his being, I didn't even know when he was foreign minister. So, and again, uh, at the point I, you know, went into the university, I wanted to, uh, to go and study uh, international relations and go into foreign service. But his age was quite advanced and health was gradually failing. And uh, so he didn't want me to go on post in, in foreign service because I was the eldest child in the house. So hence the reason why I had to opt for something that a guy didn't even like, but I had to follow his you know, instruction at that time. So, and then much later in life, you know, the day he died, that was uh, in 2001, my younger brother, who is now the Mogajingari, he got a job you know, in foreign affairs. And then, you know, uh, He's now uh, a deputy director in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and he's serving in Morocco. So you see, it's just by you know providence, not that you know there was any move to push anyone there. No, for me, no, definitely, and not for any of my siblings. In fact, most of my siblings, you know, uh, 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 he had died before they even you know, uh, started their career in school. I had to, you know, uh, put them through school with the little I was earning. But I was thrown to the world. I went to Lagos 
I was in Lagos for 10 years, you know, and then I got transferred to Abuja. You know, uh, I was in Lagos. Uh, we started the first securities discount house. And uh, I was there. I rose to the position of assistant manager and then came back to Abuja. I joined FSB International Bank at that time, the point of uh, privatization at that time. And then I came back to Abuja. You know, I was there again, and then after I left banking, I had a stint in public service in FCT as the director, like that, like that, and all other appointments that I came after. So I, uh, at, at that period, you know, he was already dead. Yeah. yeah. So I, I was on my own, like all other Nigerians. But he had never. He never had any influence about, he was not even alive to influence what I was doing, you know, uh, at that time. And even at your own age, when you're just moving up, he was, as you said, he, he's a helpless friend. And of course he Absolutely, was. because almost every week I was rushing to Zaria from Lagos. Even though it was not very expensive that time, it was 2,000 Naira to come, you know, from, from Lagos to, to Zaria. Yes, and eventually when I got transferred to Abuja, you know, I, I had to, it was much easier for me, you know, to drive, you know, home at any, you know, given time. You know, so I, I, that's how, you know, I survived all my life. Congratulations again. Your Highness, what's your defining moment? Uh, the first was when I I got married. You know, I it was strange, you know, for me to have a wife when I was an I feel all right boy, you know, and then I became a family man. It was uh, it was uh, something, you know, significant in my life. Then of course. Uh, in secondary school, the day I was appointed deputy head boy in government college in Kaduna. Yes, I never expected any position of leadership in secondary school. And that was the first outing of uh, uh, late Emir of Kaduna, uh, Kabir Usman, may Allah bless his soul. Uh, he came and held my hand. You know, at that time, if they appoint you a prefect, they'll give you a ceremonial cap. I was the smallest in the class, and uh, he held me and looked at, you know, my principal, S.A. Adele, of blessed memory also, said, Adele, how can this small boy, you know, handle this, you know, uh, uh, big boys in this school? He said, it's not about the size. It's about capacity to, uh, to, to deliver and also to control them. I was, you know, I was shivering all through that day, you know, because I, that was the first time I confronted, you know, dignitaries at that level, and uh, it was a huge, huge uh, uh, problem for me at that time. So, and then of course, when I received the news that I was appointed as, uh, you know, the successor to the late Emir, it was um, a moment that I cannot actually define because I received a call, you know, at about 10 in the morning from the secretary to the government. He requested, uh, he asked me where, where I was at that time. I said I was at home. He said, okay, he was near WAIC office, you know, near secretariat in Kao, coming to Zaria. And uh, he was pleased to inform me that he just left Kaduna, you know, coming to Zaria and that, that I'm the new emir. So I was with a you know, an associate, you know, a personal friend. 
Silicon Floating Katsina who were together in my inner room and there were so many people in the living room. Uh, but there was a kind of tension, you know, in the city for almost two weeks. Waiting. Waiting, yes. So when I heard that, I went straight, you know, to prostrate, you know, Suju the Shokor, uh, to thank Allah. It was an emotional moment. Uh, so you can float, he started crying. And I was trying to uh, tell him not to, you know, continue crying because he will create chaos there in the house because the house was... Uh, there were some people, some of my friends and associates that were in the hospital. They requested to be admitted in the hospital, you know, because they couldn't take the heat at that time. So I, I then quickly went into the inner room and changed my dress. Because he said when he arrived in Zaria, he would go to meet the kingmakers and then they will invite us to the mosque or to the palace. So I had to change my dress, I came back. I, but I, even though he told me that, I was still not too convinced. And so a few moments uh, after uh, then, uh, there was uh, a call by some of the uh, king makers that they were coming to my house. So, and then when they came, like 10 minutes after the call, they drove to the house. And uh, when people saw them coming to the house, they knew that something had happened. And then the house went upside down. So uh, that was the last I can, you know, remember, I think, at that particular moment. And uh, so I, uh, in fact, I didn't even see my family, my, my stepmother and my mother. I was whisked away and I came back a different person, you know. And so that's how it all started and uh, alhamdulillah, all is well that ends well. Now that you're on the set, what do you want to be remembered for? A just leader. That's all. Wish you all the best, Your Allah. Inshallah. I mean, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's been a 55 minute discussion with uh, Israel Hannes, the AMA representative. Reflections comes back again next week with another personality. But don't forget, we are not done with the area. We may come back and of course have some more about his life and his future. Until then, I'm Mr. Dabuzo. Bye bye.